On June 2nd and 3rd, 2011, the Center for Design and Geopolitics held its first annual conference in La Jolla at Cal IT2, the California Institute of Telecommunications and Information Technology, on the campus of the University of California at San Diego. It's my pleasure then to turn to the fun, the fun part of all of this and to introduce my friends and speakers, um, the first of which is Norman Klein. Um, Norman is a genuine polymath, a friend, a curiosity, uh, <laughs> a genius of, of a species of one. Norman is a cultural critic, an urban and media historian, a novelist. He's the author of The History of Forgetting, Los Angeles and the Erasure, the Erasure of Memory, Seven Minutes, The Life and Death of the American Animated Cartoon, of the, of the cinematic novel, Bleeding Through, Layers of Los Angeles. Um, my favorite book of his is, Vatican, is a book called From Vatican to Vegas, The History of Special Effects. Uh, and today, Norman is going to share with us a project that he's been working on for quite some time, the, the secret history of the 20th, 20th century, which is actually about the way in which the 19th century imagined the 20th century. So it's my pleasure to welcome Norman Klein. I don't have to repeat a lot of things, or do I? Uh, yeah, so I had introductory, or may, maybe we'll wait, can we op open the file? Yes. Oh, yeah. This is a, a prototype, this is complete blankness, right? Can we see it? Hello. Anyway, what will, well, working on getting it. It's a prototype for a project that's taken about six years. It's, co uh, it's called The Imaginary 20th Century. It's a large media novel that um, has about 2,200 images. The images are, are an, an, an interface. Oh, uh, this, yeah. This is it? No, that's actually not it. That's the, um, the website. I have the wrong one. That's the website, not the disk. Really? Yep. Okay, then it must be, it just looks a lot like the website. Anyway, this, this appeared in Prague, and um, it has 12 chapters. This is just uh, the, the map for one of them. This is chapter, the second chapter. The, the lead character, her name is Carrie. In, in 1901, according to a legend which may not be true, selected four men to seduce her. Each had to produce his version of the next century. And this is a process of her before she meets them, she goes to the science and crafts movement, which as many of you know, and everyone's gonna look at me, because it sounds like you did know, in fact, there never was a science and crafts movement, but there should have been. And they're, they're headquartered in Greece, or they have a campus in Greece, and as one hits each one of these clusters, that's me talking, but I'm already talking, right? So I talk through the story, uh, some of the elements, and then I'll, I'll take, uh, let's say, I don't, I don't know, one of the clusters to give a sense of it. Uh, and, and this will be more or less how it'll work, uh, very, very simple and direct. Isn't it? Yeah. So it'll open out, and then you'll be able to go in up to six times each time and be able to see it. Oop move it around and so on and then go and then go back very simple very extremely straightforward it has to it has to be an, an, a 2011 version of looking how in the 1890s and 1900 they imagined the next century and also what they failed to imagine properly for example they 
uh, imagined it would be essentially dominated by blimps when in fact it wasn't, and so on and so on. And, these are, and you'll be able to go in maybe six times uh, in, in detail. Uh, these are very, this is Epidaurus. And then these are some of the other elements that will be added. This is only the prototype, so that would mean you'd, you'd see a lot more. Uh, I'll show you the next one, and then I'll start talking. I'm trying not to run out of time. I think I would, uh, I'll do that. This is the, the, so each, each chapter has its own map, and each map has up to 300 images in clusters with a voiceover. And then there's a book to go with it that um, is part of the same novel. So in, in a sense, it's an amalgam where the book and the site are, are one. They're actually a novel. The novel is both. So, oh, oh there it is, yeah. Now this is one of the worlds invented by one of her lovers, I guess one could say. He's a, a confused Swiss businessman who hates his family and is constantly escaping. And this has, a, 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 again, a little bit of a story that we voice over somewhere. And then um, any number of these uh, clusters. The clusters are put in, in a very, very simple form, similar, similar to the spirit of, of the late, early 20th century. And uh, I don't know, let's see what would be fun. Oh, God, there's so many. Th these are strange postcards from that era. This is the electrical experimenter that, that becomes uh, later the birth of science, uh, the science fiction design. And, and then you, you simply move them around and then you'd be able to go into them. This is a Germ German notions of things. This is the imaginary city and um, each map is color coded. It's based on on fantasies that were common to the period, and so on. And, uh, the, the, it goes on and on and on. I could spend 20 minutes. Uh, I just had to write something about L.A. Noir and that game, and it took 19 hours to go through a game that essentially was like a giant polished jelly bean. Went on and on and on. So I, I don't know how many hours it'll take to go through this jelly bean, right? But we don't have very much, so we have to go on. Um, okay, uh, let's see. Here's, here's some more. These are, and these are variations of the city of the future. Oh, excuse me. Oh. Someone else is operating. Well, maybe per other person should. Well, why should I operate? Other people. These, this is a city that was imagined in the turn of the century, and of course never happened uh, except for the baseball stadium. There are so many variations of uh, the, the layering of the city, variations as to how power would operate, um, a tremendous amount of paranoia about uh, women in power coming, about socialism in power coming, and also fear of the nation state. They were already imagining in considerable detail what World War I would look like by the 1870s. So there are up to 500 page books detailing how all of it would work. And then once the war started, they were happy, they forgot the books and killed each other. <laughs> so a few obvious points about the future we can say very briefly, and then I'll try to run through more notes than I should have brought. Uh, one is that the future is always a caricature of the present and it ages very, very fast. So that's one of our geopolitical problems that we are constantly imagining that we're actually achieving the future. We're caricaturing the present and in 10 minutes it's old. That's so weird, so difficult. The, 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 the future leaves tremendous amounts of residue, unacted detail. Th this residue continues to haunt, uh, in, uh, haunt the culture and it becomes science fiction, it becomes uh, plans and so on, and it, it, it never quite achieves what it's about. And also, we now no longer want the future. And, and building on what you said, and I, I wouldn't even, I have all these notes I was going to read, but it looks like I may as well keep talking because here it goes, right? Uh, you talked about the geopolitical crisis, which is what my summary was. The geopolitical crisis is going to appear in another book of mine that is called The Dismantling of the American Psyche. And it's about why Americans are so tolerant 
in their crusade to dismantle their own government and why so little can be planned. And I tried to go over all these different models, very similar in process to what, what uh, your talk was, and it became clear to me the only model that could explain the nature of the American experience anyway, not trying to uh, overgeneralize it so broad, that the United States is heading toward a kind of feudalism. So I do agree with that. A feudalism more like the 17th century than, than early century, a feudalism that more like colonial feudalism. So in effect, the United States has become a colony of itself. It's a kind of extinct volcano with a hole in the center where the national government used to be. And then out of this, out of this feudalism, a few obvious uh, problems in terms of cultural, uh, cultural dynamic and politics. Politics, horrible, right? Not much, not much can be said. But uh, it becomes very regional. It tends to be more democratic in a regional way. It, it tends to become very oligarchical to the point of divine right of the 1% to never pay taxes. Uh, other qualities of feudalism, it's very, very bad at master planning and it's horrible at distributing new forms of culture. It goes very, very slowly and it has a shelf laugh, life laugh, a shelf laugh. Right? It's a shelf laugh that's almost unendurably long. Right? People would keep asking, why is the czar still there? <laughs> I said, because we all love him. <laughs> We love the little father, that son of a bitch, asshole, miserable, you know, you know <laughs> monstrous vampire. We love him. You know, and it goes on and on, century after century. And there are, there are all sorts of stories. And one has to imagine that the end of the 20th century was almost like a kind of French Revolution that wound up in 1620, but with cell phones. <laughs> uh, so when you deal with all of this, one tries to also see what do we mean by new forms in a context like this? Because to simply say the new tablet, the new Zoom, right? Uh, the new Adobe, Adobe software patch, right? We'll, we'll, we'll answer it is, is not true. We'll probably have to look over the last three or 400 years for forms that are appropriate for new directions in fiction and so forth. I'm quite convinced, for example, that the picaresque novel works much better now than it used to. In other words, Huckleberry Finn uh, and maybe Moby Dick in a strange way, but, but, but not Henry James anymore, sadly enough. Right? And so this is done as a kind of uh, picaresque novel about adapting dynamically to a future that has nothing but entropy ahead of it. The whole point of the picaresque novel uh, is essentially a person on the road who will stay on the road because the road will stay, and then that's it. And that's why um, Mark Twain writes uh, Huckleberry Finn about the death of the South, but he writes the Connecticut Yankee about the ironies of the North. Two different versions of science fiction, if you will. So it looks like uh, we're going down the river with Huck and we're never going to leave for a long time. Now, of course, the needs are so vast, are so colossal, that to have a 17th century overlapping form of uh, regionalized sub-monarchies to have a Hanseatic League right? <laughs> uh, operating our culture and operating our planning is desperately scary. On the other hand, possibly a bottom-up strategy might work. So there are any ways of looking at this, but all of them will lead towards something like a kind of feudalism. I would say closer to feudalism when there was still already a nation state, not feudalism the guys in tights and, and you know, big, big bows and arrows. More like a feudalism in the Confederate South, but with cell phones. More like a feudalism in 17th or century Europe, something like that. A Baroque feudalism, right? So I call it electronic Baroque or electronic feudalism. And here I was going to spend 10 minutes explaining it, but uh, Benjamin did it so much better. I, I think I can build on this. Let's see some more of this. Okay. And you understand this is only a fraction of the, of the final version. Huh, let's see. And also, the, the, it's be, it'll be curatorially um, all laid, laid out, looking at, the, at, at basic shapes. I found that there are basic tropes that keep reappearing over and over again. They're like haunted. For example, I now can, in one gesture, show you the Industrial Revolution. Okay. <gasps> That's it. 
I, I found this shape fully engaged from the 1820s. I found versions of this shape that look exactly like motion picture projectors, except they're used in making cotton by the 1880s and 90s. So there are certain uh, re uh, repetitive shapes, and here's one of them, obviously, these, these uh, almost like a pipe organ of death, you know? You can begin to see it. So part of the, part of the purpose of a project like this is to, is to begin to see certain of the basic shapes. Let's see, I'll go back. Um, and understand there'll be 12 chapters. It has, it has its own sound system. It has voiceovers. And, and then it has its own novel. And uh, it's quite layered. But it's done as a kind of picaresque, a very tactile version. Let's see, here's another one. Oh, these are, oh, this, is a, this is a common problem. The fear of the body not being ready for modern life. This is one of the great paranoias. How to build a body without fatigue, a body that never gets tired. Um, I, I, our belief is more to have a body that's inviolate, as I call it, as in the color violet, not to be inviolate. A color a person who's inviolate lives in a constant state of plastic surgery and foreboding. They will be 30 forever. And no matter what happens, there will be no future. They're like Ophelia drowning every week, but with really, really good plastic surgery. And then suddenly bursting at the end and going, going, going whatever to find a, a new lover or to go dancing or telling Hamlet he's an asshole or something like that. So the, but the late 19th century version was, was very much about what they called neurasthenia, the fear that the body was, was going to collapse under the impact of modern life. Is, does this look familiar? Look, looks like one of your images. The residue of the imaginary 20th century that keeps coming back, the idea that somehow you can make a giant engine city, a city that's a complete engine, and inside that engine, people would become more or less nothing. That's what was really thinking about. But let's try another one. This one has haunted many people. The idea of a city so layered that you have cities under the city with mechanical streets. So the idea of having a, uh, a city under the city that is uh, fully mobilized. In, in the 1900 World's Fair, they they practiced this and then gave it up. Let's see what else. Then the fear of women, of course. Yeah. Uh, this this endless paranoia of women being being identified with uh, with industrialism. It's interesting to see how these paranoias act out or don't act out. We looked at over 150,000 images, and only selected uh, various images that that had to do with what this woman and, her, and these characters would see. And we have to leave a lot of gaps. Part of it is how you tell a story on a computer, which frankly is not novelistic despite all of its genius. And you have to leave gaps. And the gaps have to be of the sort that you can mentally enter, almost like folklore. So it's a folkloric form of a novel with picaresque elements. There seems to be no other way at this point. To, for me to imagine what to do with the giant archival energy of the computer. And I'm still not convinced it can generate what we love as the novel. On the other hand, look at the power of the thing. It's just extraordinary. What would a book look like with 2,200 images? I mean, how much would it weigh and what would it do? But still, it needs the, uh, uh, the actual text with it. Let's see, I'll try another. How much time do I have left? I mean, it's interesting just to go through this. Huh? Right, so this is the has been color coded to uh, 1900. Each one is color coded based on maps, but the maps have to follow another logic that we found in our research. We discovered that of the 150,000 images that we saw up to the year 1914, 1893 to 25, only five of them, not 500, but five, actually were about cinema. We couldn't understand why, if everyone was going to cinema, 
the visual logic was different. But if you, the visual logic of the period was, was more diagonal and circuitous, it, wasn't, it didn't have the legibility of film. So that meant there was an entirely different visual tradition of logic and meaning that vanished by 1915 and afterward. So we have this 20-year period. I, I talked with Tom Gunning about this 20-year period, and he now agrees, he being the Santa Claus of all pre-cinematic theory, right? that, that um, there is a hole, and that perhaps people have been looking at the magazines only for the people who are projecting movies, not the magazines that people are reading every day. Does that make sense? So what we have is an oral culture dominated by dense cities without without the trolley systems changing them yet, and very much about mass, mass printing with magazine illustrations designed to be looked at for 10 minutes or half an hour. Very, very circuitous, very diagonal, very curious. And so each map had to, in a way, be a kind of psycho, psycho represent, psychocartographic representation of the chapter, but based on an actual mapping system from the period. I know it sounds complicated, but it's, it's a, you know it sounds like a real pain in the ass, right? It took seven months to do these maps. Um, and that, that would mean you, you find uh, different elements. And it was also printed to look as if it's on old paper. So we had to scan it on old paper to give the illusion of not knowing whether it actually was there or not. Because playing with tangibility and playing with this blur, right? between fact and fiction is also very important for a story like this. I think little by little we're going to find out what other kinds of narratives really capture the anxieties of our moment. And uh, I, I don't know. I, I often say to students, 60% of a great idea is perfect. I don't know, maybe this is 49%, 51%. I, I don't know what 60% looks like, but I know that work like this is going to have to be needed. How do we stand now? Just So let us say that this is taking Benjamin's talk in the spirit of the dismantling of the American psyche anyway, and a story set in the mood of 2011, but transferred back systematically, detail by detail, into the last century. So it's one century in its anxiety, looking at another century's anxieties in, in some structural way. And the point of my being here is to open up questions, not answers. So I hope there are many of them. And this will open up at least a discussion that could become a discourse, right? <laughs> Toward making some of these new forms possible. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Norman. Appreciate that.